So uh, my name is Kirsten Nauman. I am the program coordinator for TPOD, which is Tremble's Prevention Partnership. And I want to welcome you all here tonight on behalf of TPOD and the many community partners who have made this Let's Talk Mental Health Trumbull series available to you. Um, this is our fourth installment. So if you did not get a chance to see the first three, I encourage you to uh, watch it on demand on Trumbull Community Television, or you can also find it on the TPOD website and all of our presentations will be available going forward. So um, if you ever want to rewatch one or share it with someone else, they're always available to you. So um, before we get started tonight with Kristen Dubay Horton, I do want to turn it over to Vicky Chisora, our first selectman, who is here to introduce uh, Kristen to us tonight. So thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Kirsten, and good evening, everybody. So it is my pleasure to welcome you to our fourth installment of Let's Talk Mental Health Trumbull. Once again, I wanna thank all of the town organizations who have been involved in planning these sessions. Trumbull PTA Council, Trumbull EMS, the Mary J. Sherlock Counseling Center, Lakewood Trumbull YMCA, Confident Health, My Friend Abby, Progressive Institute, Trumbull Community Television, and TPOD Trumbull's Prevention Partnership. We are recording these sessions and they will be made available on demand by Trumbull Community TV and on the TPOD website. Tonight, we're pleased to welcome our speaker, Kristen Dubay Horton, to talk about building resilience in our young people. Our kids have faced challenges these last few years that we, as parents, didn't have to face at their age. We didn't grow up with social media, which plays such a prominent role in their lives. We are excited to welcome Kristen to help us navigate this world with our kids and help them build resilience. Kristen Dubay Horton is a longtime friend of Trumbull and played a critical role in Teapot's creation. Kristen is a gifted trainer and speaker and brings with her a lifetime of work around public health and mental health promotion. She received her BA from Yale University and completed her master's degree at Boston University. During her career, Kristen has conducted training sessions for nonprofits, municipalities, and state agencies and served as a national technical assistance provider for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. As principal of a public health consulting practice in Bridgeport, Connecticut, for 17 years, she focused on community-based public health work. Kristen also served as health and social services director for the city of Bridgeport for five years, where she led the team that won the Robert Wood Johnson Culture of Health Prize. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you so much, Vicki, and I'm so pleased that you um, think of me as a friend of Trumbull because I think of myself as a friend of Trumbull. And I'm really excited to, to be here tonight and to share some of my thoughts. And I, I will say that um, I'm not just the speaker, I'm also a parent of um, two teenagers and a 21 year old. So I'm living through this um, with all of you. And so I hope what I share this evening will help all of us understand it better. Um, I hope to share real strategies um, with you and there'll be, um, obviously you can look at the talks again and there'll be a sort of a one page um, cheat sheet um, from tonight that you'll be able to get off the Trumbull, the Teapot website later. Okay, so I'm gonna talk very sort of informally. If you have thoughts or questions, um, you're gonna put them in the Q&A feature and um, Kirsten will um, seamlessly deliver them to me, but that way this is gonna work better for uh, when it's recorded um, for folks to watch um, later. It's a little less Pickledy pickledy. Um, okay, so let's talk um, about trauma and resilience um, for kids. And I think of this as sort of kids, sort of 11 to uh, 25, the TikTok generation. Um, so, what I'm hoping um, that you're going to get out of today's talk is, first of all, an understanding of why sort of the goal, and this is a public health thought, is that you really have to start right where people are. If you have someone who is um, a hoarder, you can't come in and just 
take everything and throw it away. You have to begin with a conversation about why are they hoarding and what might they be willing to get with, rid of. If they're not along the ride with you, then you're dragging them and it's not effective way to help within the mental health struggles that you're facing. It's the same around the use of social media. I also really wanna think about, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about this later, about how social media can be both a stressor and a resiliency builder. And young people see social media as both. They see it as a place when they're feeling down, to go for alone, to go for support, to find other people who may be struggling in the same ways. And so when we as parents say, social media is a bad thing, you shouldn't be using it, they then respond, right? The same way when you tell your 15 year old anything, they look at you like you're the stupidest person who has ever walked into the room and you're shutting the conversation down. So we're gonna talk real strategies about how you can work with your kids on this. I wanna give us all some real basic social media one-on-one -on -one and um, how you can use it to form connection and leave us some hands-on tools about resiliency building. Um, if you think of um, trauma and resiliency as two sides of the same coin, trauma is the bad thing that, uh, that occurs that you're not, you're struggling with and you're figuring out how to manage. Resiliency is the pieces of you that um, rebound and say, okay, this, these are the pieces of me. Like your white blood cells when you get an infection, resiliency is what helps you pull through the traumatic experiences. And we all experience trauma. Okay, so one Devo, one Mike, that's easy tonight because you know you guys don't get to talk. Um, I'm gonna ask that the stories that I tell or the questions that people ask um, stay here, but that the themes, you know, that when you're at dinner with friends tomorrow, you can say, hey, I heard this great talk and there were a lot of ideas that you might wanna go in and listen to because maybe you'd find it helpful. Um, I'm moving fast. I will try to get you out of here um, by seven or eight-ish, um, but um, if you have questions, throw them to Kirsten and she will get them to me. All right, we're gonna move ahead. So I'm gonna have you think back to some big news things that have happened in my lifetime and I assume most of your lifetimes. Where were you when you heard about the Challenger disaster? And I don't know for This Is Us fans, um, I think of the Challenger disaster in entirely different ways now, but um, where were you? How did you find out about it? And I can tell you sort of how I found out about it. I've had a very early class that morning. I was in high school and I was in the dining hall and they had a radio on. So the first place I heard about the Challenger disaster was via radio. There were no pictures to go with it instantly. Um, Kirsten, are people thrown into the chat when they may have heard about or how or? Not yet. Not yet. Um, but while okay. we're waiting, I'll tell you where I was. Okay. I, we had a snow day. I was in the eighth grade. We had a snow day from school and I was watching TV in the morning with my mom. And she had gone into the bathroom and I watched it. And I remember saying to her, oh my God, mom, you've got to come out here. I think, I think something just went really wrong. Um, so that, that was my story. Does anyone else want to share where they might have been? And I was, I think I was 1986, I was probably, you know, 16 or 17. By the time Princess Diana died, I was, sort of, okay, I probably felt like a grown up. Um, and I was um, at the office. Um, I was working um, fairly late. We had a grant, prop a grant project due and um, someone saw it. And um, we sort of went not to our iPhones because we didn't have them at that point really. Um, but we went into the internet and into sort of to try to find it because we were in an office and you didn't have TV easily accessible to you. When you move forward, right? By 2009, when Michael Jackson died, it popped up on my phone. It was a news alert. And sort of from about that time, sort of the last 10 or 12 years, I'm hearing it with, you know, I, I'm 
subscribe to them. Like I have a New York Times. Um, I subscribe to the New York Times news. I get news from NPR. I also get sort of NBC news because they give us the best weather alerts. And I'm always worried about kids in the pool during thunderstorms. So um, those are sort of, but it all is coming to me instantly. And in a way that um, unless I'm driving with do not disturb on, I can't turn it off. It comes. When I think about the war now in the Ukraine, the invasion of the Ukraine by Russia, that's something that we all see day by day. I know the names of all those towns now. I know whether they're big towns or small towns. I know what the um, Russian troops are doing on a daily basis, whether they're shelling the factory or leaving the factory alone. Um, I see that a war almost instantaneously. So how we view news and information has shifted enormously in the past 30 years. When you look at how people use news by age group, it's fascinating. When you think of folks 65 and over, even today, this is news, this is uh, numbers from February 22 from Statistica, um, more than 20% of folks over 65 are still reading a newspaper as a primary source of their news and information. And we realize all that information is old enough, right, where they had time to write it down and to print it and then to drive it to you. They also still rely on radio, about 10% of them. Network news is a huge source of news and information for them, more than 40%. And social media comes in under 25%. So for that generation, really and truly, they are still leaning toward older forms of news that we may have used. I've never read a newspaper that got my hands dirty. I've been reading um, newspapers on the internet my entire life. Um, for Okay, for as long as I, I've read newspapers. When you look at 18 to 34 year olds, and sorry, that's how they grouped it. They don't break it out for 18 to 25s and um, sort of 25 to 44 or 34. We see that about 10% of them read a newspaper. Almost 20% of them still get news from the radio, but less than 15% are lis listening to or watching CBS, NBC, or um, CNN, or um, MSNBC, or Fox News, or any of those channels. So network news becomes a very small percentage of how they're getting news and information. But here's the real kicker at least for me, 45% of young people are using social media as a nude site. I'm gonna say that again, 45% of people under the age of 35 in the US are using social media as their primary source of news. Now, the differences between a newspaper, radio, network news, and social media is that those first three have processes that try to ensure the rigor and the reality of the news that is being shared. They don't always get it right. They may have a spin or a lean but they have at least have that stopgap. I don't know if we would argue that Facebook or Instagram have adequate ways. And that's certainly been a huge discussion since the election in 2020. So young people think of and utilize social media much more heavily than their grandparents or their parents as a primary news source. 
and are much less likely to utilize and rely on news sources that have places, things in place to ensure that the information is accurate. So you might say to me, what the heck does this have to do with social media and trauma and resilience? So these are three very popular um, two are videos. Um, the Social Dilemma is the video that was on Netflix and talked a lot about, if you've, if you've, you know, if you've not seen or looked at any of these things, the Social Dilemma is still really um, probably the um, most rigorous study of the effects of social media on the brain. Um, Screenagers, which now has both a uh, first documentary and a second documentary, really looks at the effect of social media on young people. Young people as young as five years old. And The Teenage Brain is a book that, that I've read and that um, is a relatively dense but fascinating read that really looks at how the activities and the things that we do as adults affect children. I don't know if folks have seen these um, things um, or read any of these things or heard anything about them. But in the community that I now live in, in Texas, we put on a huge community event, it was pre-COVID, and watched um, screenagers in three different um, church sites as a community, and then engaged in an hour long in each of the three sites, conversation with leaders in our community about what we thought about um, the film and what we thought we as a community should be doing. And the, um, the take home message um, from Screen Ages was really about the negative effects and the addictive nature of social media largely based on the amount of um, work social media does to keep us flipping or clicking or looking at whatever they are selling to us. The social dilemma talks about that and talks specifically a lot more about um, Facebook and the way that they have made your feed and, and probably um, from my children, um, from personal experience, you can see as you begin using any of the platforms that you use, whether it's Facebook or LinkedIn, or you, know, you curate the information that you see by picking the, the people who you want to see information from, but then, the social media platform learns your preferences. They learn how long you stay on each of those pages that get fed to you. I will say that I was looking for sandals for graduation for my daughter. I found a pair, but I really wanted to find them cheaper than what they were going to cost. And so once I started looking at these Dansko sandals, um, those appeared in my feed from different places constantly. I could not escape the yellow sandals. And I bought, and in fact, I'm wearing right now the yellow sandals, but it learned me. It knew what I was interested in, and it continued to pull me in. So these are a few of the most popular apps for kids. I will say I'm not a TikToker. Um, I'm a Facebooker. I have a Twitter account because and when I was a health director, my mayor required us all to have a Twitter account and to start communicating with folks. WeChat, WhatsApp, Instagram, all of these apps are very popular. Let me also say that the way we as adults utilize them is very different than how our kids utilize them. When I hop on Facebook, 
I go on to hear what my friends are doing, what my friends' children are doing. I want to know what the artist who I follow um, is going to have another show. I want to know about, um, uh, you know, This Is Us, which I was completely addicted to. Um, this year, I wanted to have conversations with other people who were interested in the things that I was interested in. I didn't follow strangers. I didn't follow celebrities. It was for me a way to keep in touch with people who I've gotten far away from and who I care about. Young people are much more likely to utilize these sorts of sites and social media feeds to follow famous people who they are interested in. Um, when we looked at Charlotte, who's my youngest child now, Charlotte not only spends an exorbitant amount of time on TikTok, she spends most of that time looking at Harry Styles feeds. She just does. It is like hours every day focused on what Terry's wearing, when his record is coming out, who he's dating. It, it is a plethora of information I would never have any interest. But because that is where she shows interest, the other things that come into her feed are other things that they consider similar. We're going to talk a little more about that. But think about how you use whatever social media account you use and how your children do and how those things might be different. And you're not gonna know that unless you begin to have conversations about it. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit about trauma. And I pick trauma from the Batman metaverse here. Batman, his backstory, Folks, remember what that is? Batman watched his parents murdered in front of him by a criminal. He was raised by a butler who was working in his home, who loved him and cared for him. But he grew up very alone without spending a lot of time once he had lost his parents with other children, with other families the Joker. The Joker was also parentless as a child and grew up without any real social network because he wasn't cool. He didn't fit in in society. And so he felt very alienated from community. Both of these people who are childless, both of these people are alone or are parentless and alone. However, and I would say they're probably both very dark characters. These are not, um, you know, the happy-go-lucky um, superheroes or supervillains. However, Batman turns that trauma into a calling into a need to help and save the world and protect children from the sort of loss and struggle and alienation that he faced. The Joker, on the other hand, turns, into, turns that loss and that alienation and that sort of not being accepted within a community into anger and the want and the need to destroy the community that didn't accept him. Now, obviously this is a total oversimplification of trauma, but the difference between Batman and the Joker wasn't that they didn't both experience trauma. It's that after the trauma, the Batman was raised in a loving and supportive way by Albert, right? Who becomes his tether, what keeps him engaged. That love and support made his outcome different, provided 
Batman with the resilience, not to still, he's a dark human being, right? We all know that. But that piece of his life allowed him to recover. And I know this is a really huge oversimplification of um, trauma and resilience and the difficulties that we face. But what I really want you to think about um, is the fact that resilience is the other side of the coin and the piece that we want to build in kids. And you can't really know what is gonna be traumatizing for them. So this is sort of a more technical um, piece. Trauma isn't the bad thing. It happens when your brain responds to the bad thing. Both Batman and Joker lost their parents. They both experienced a horrible loss. But we all experience traumatic events. What is different between be carrying that trauma with you forever and recovering from it is your ability to accept and address the traumas you face. We talk a lot, kids talk a lot um, about, um, you know, they're traumatized, it's a joke, it's um, often not seen seriously by young people. But what we, I think as parents, really need to think about is whether or not the bad stuff that's going to occur, whether or not they have the skills and the supports to cope with them. So I um, wonder, I will say that when my, my oldest child was uh, a sophomore in high school, um, he did a debate presentation on mental health anxiety, depression in teenagers. And as I sat and listened to it, because he would practice endlessly, that it was, um, he was doing speech and debate um, competitively and everything was had to be timed and um, whatever. So I heard it often. And how I felt as a parent, as my then 16 year old who was going to a really good high school, um, who was um, you know, driving himself there, um, who you know, never worried about having enough food to eat or enough, um, you know, had lots of people around him who loved him. I thought, what is this kid talking about? Being, kids being anxious and depressed. This is like, this is, they must be the most um, over, um, coddled um, group of kids. However, as I started to dig deeper and I did, we had a, um, a lot of mental health issues within our school system um, in Texas. I thought about what this kid had gone through. He was born the same year as the Twin Tower bombing. I was nursing him the day that it happened and um, watched it. He's never known a world without the war on terror. There are 3,500 school shootings in the U.S. Oh, sorry, deaths in the U.S. on an average year um, from school shootings. I think about the fact that, you know, for my kids, Sandy Hook will always be the day that changed. You know, they're very open um, school, all of a sudden had locked doors and passcodes and um, you know, they're doing, you know, active shooter drills. My kids were really frightened at the insurrection. And I think no matter what side of the political um, spectrum you were on, January 6th was a scary day. And that was another thing that, you know, I heard the news, I got a news alert on my phone. I turned on the computer in my home office because we were working from home. And we watched that happen live. 
the murder of George, George Floyd, which I have never watched that entire video, my kids have seen dozens, if not hundreds of times. The Buffalo mass shooting, the Evolve back shooting, even the COVID pandemic. I struggled to really keep my head on straight throughout the past three years. How could I possibly expect young people to be able to do the same when we all know, right? Their brains are not fully formed. Is trauma worse when it happens to kids? That's what it gets to the brain development piece. So this is an absolutely true story. And I guess I would give you permission to share this with others, but I am terrified of squirrels really and truly terrified. I can't eat on the Boston Common because they come up and want to get food from you. It was upsetting to me when I was in college to walk across the green because they were like everywhere. And it wasn't until I was dating my husband, which was my junior year in college, that all of a sudden it clicked in my brain where it began. It began when I was probably nine or 10 we were in the basement of my neighbor's house. That was where we played during the summer because it wasn't hot. Um, and we were doing whatever kids do in a basement during the summer. And all of a sudden, Cheryl Oganowski, that was the girl's house who I was at, her mother screamed down the stairs, don't come up under any circumstances, all H-E double hockey sticks and she did say that H-E double hockey sticks have broken loose. She slammed the door and we could hear them above us. And there were things breaking and crashes and all kinds of things happening upstairs. Well, it turned out that a squirrel had come down the chimney and they were trying to get it out. And for me, it was terrifying that adults could lose control. And the way my brain filed that was to be terrified of squirrels. Honestly, I don't like any kind of rodent, but squirrels are particularly the worst thing. And when I found out, found out that there are squirrels that can fly, I nearly lost my mind. Trauma plus whether or not you have the strength and the resilience and the ability to accept it is what causes you to carry long time issues. All right, so is it worse to be a teen in 2022 than it was when I was a teen in like really in 1989, but I couldn't find the numbers to go back that far. So the blue bars, talk about the percentage of kids, and these are national youth risk behavior survey data, um, that we have grown from about 28% to about 35% of kids say that they feel sad and ho hopeless most of the time. When you look at suicide, considering suicide, just below 20%. E-bullying in the white BRBS was really first asked in 2019. So we can see that about 15% of kids feel e-bullied. And about 60% today are watching screens more than 10 hours a day. So I put up the Breakfast Club and Love, Simon because I think they're indicative of sort of the differences in the time periods. But I wonder, I wonder whether or not young people today are struggling more. And you have probably better local data in Trumbull than anyone has anywhere because you're surveying those kids so often and you can really look and understand and see the differences that are occurring over time. So how do you 
create resilience. And I really, I think about Yusuf, Malala Yusuf, Yusuf, Yusuf C often, because here's this amazing woman, girl, when it all happened, who was shot in the head because she wanted to go to school. And when she healed, she continued to speak out despite the fact that it was of great risk to her, of great risk to her. And when people talk about what you, what, 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 and what she talks about is where she went to find strength. If you're looking for yourself, find someone to talk to. If you're thinking about it for your kids, be someone to talk to. And better than for your kids, be, it, be that person for your kids' friends because they don't want to talk to you as a parent necessarily and you can be the cool other parent. She recognizes or recommends exercise, meditation, yoga, not trying to numb the pain with drugs and alcohol and finding space for joy. All of these things help you build resilience in yourself and in your children. So are kids getting worse because they all are on social media all the time, right? We talked about the, the screenagers video and the social dilemma. How much of this is really about the fact that on average, teens are using the internet for nine hours a day. Now, honestly, pre-COVID, I was a crazy person. I had my kids having to earn screen time. They got an hour every day of screen time and they could earn more by doing chores, by getting good grades, by exercising. Um, but I made them work for it and I limited it. What happened when we all cloistered in our homes is that there was just no way to limit it, right? They had to be on the internet for six hours a day just to go to school. And then they had to be on the internet to do the homework for school. And so I think we're all really struggling with how to shift the conversation, how to figure out how our kids are using the sites and the work. So how can you support your kids and other kids in your community? I would begin by having open communication. And our open communication has always been, if I'm paying your phone bill, I have the password to your phone and the right to see everything on it. Um, if I'm paying the Wi-Fi, um, Everyone is that nothing that you do on your phone is private. Every photo my children take uploads immediately into the family photo album. Um, establish family agreements on how you use social media and how you use the internet. Um, the very beginning of the pandemic, my all my kids came home from wherever they were and everyone was taking um, classes on the internet and we crashed a lot until we could get you know things to expand our network service and have everyone to be able to be on zoom at the same time all day um but really and truly having an open conversation and be honest um one of the things the games that we play is i snapshot everyone's screen time and I, i've got another slide on that and and I talk to them honestly, like I spend a lot of times playing cribbage on the phone. And um, I try very hard to look at it when I have a day and I say, where did the day go? I was gonna get the laundry done and I had planned to um, you know, do X, Y, and Z and none of it happened. And I'm like, oh, three and a half hours playing cribbage. That's what happened. Um, be even keeled in your discussion with kids about social media, not I hate social media, it's the worst thing that happened. It's the worst thing you can do to spend your time. But 
talk about responsible use about protecting themselves you know sharing a, a snapshot of yourself is 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 fine until someone takes your head and pastes it on the body of a you know of someone wearing a nazi uniform and sends it to your football coach right um you need to really be honest and open with your kids and give them the space to be open and honest with you by telling them the struggles you're having with it Here's my make it a game. You can get this screenshot either on an Android phone or on your um, Apple device, print them out, share them at the table, have everyone guess whose time is whose, whose, whose phone is whose, or have everyone um, estimate their own time and see who can get closer. We call it prices, right? Because who can get closer without staying under, not going over. Um, and we see who can do, um, who can get closest to their own estimation of how they use time. We do it always as a surprise. Um, and people get to do things like pick the night movie for the night or um, get out of dishes for a week. Get out of dishes for a week is particularly popular in my household. <sighs> so we're all human. So before I came on, I'm on sort of an extended trip. I'm in, um, I'm in Boston, I'm going to a high school, my daughter's high school um, graduation, and then we're headed to the vineyard for a week. So one of the things that I was doing before we left was I cleaned out the fridge. Um, and I picked up a spoonful of yogurt and I smelled it and I said, I'm not sure this is good. So what did I do immediately? I turned to my husband and said, hey, smell this. Do you think it's good? I got sucked in today to looking to see where Meghan Markle and Prince Harry were on the balcony to watch the parade. And I even got sucked into reading two articles about it. I don't even care about the royal family. We've been driving a lot. I drove into New York last night to see my nieces. Um, and we were stuck in a traffic jam on the merit but for what felt like forever. And what did I do as soon as I got to the place of the accident? Look, right? Try to figure out exactly what happened, who hit who, and when it, was everyone okay? And understand, we're all human. We all get drawn in to things that we see on the internet. So the fact is, when you see something horrific, the first thing you may do is hit it again and make sure it is what you thought it was, right? You look again. And then maybe you say, oh, I say, Carl, look what I got. This is horrible. And we share it. What you need to realize is that looking at the horrific three, four times, forwarding it to a friend to see the horrific, um, all affects your algorithm. And what it means is more of the same kind of horror is coming your way. It is very unnatural to not respond when things offend instantly. So if you see something that's terrific, you know, a meme, don't forward it, don't um, watch it again, screenshot it if you'd like to, or videotape it on your screen. Now I'm sounding old, I suppose, videotape. Record it on your screen and share it outside the app. If you share it within the app, you're bringing more of the same back to you. Follow your kids. If your kids have Instagram or TikTok or whatever accounts, follow them. Or I'm not sure with all kinds of phones, um, but you can also have them set up a parallel account so that you see everything that they see. And if you see something that is offensive, you can then fight back by sending them, you know, 11 posts that are the exact opposite. So if they're getting posts about neo-Nazism, you can send them posts from the Anti-Defamation League that will counteract the algorithm. You truly can affect the algorithm by changing the way you look and use those apps. 
follow whoever your kids follow. I now follow Harry Styles on Instagram. And I forward positive things back to my kid when I see that Harry Styles did something great. When I know it's something that's gonna be supportive and reinforcing ideas and thoughts that I believe in, I forward those. A, it makes me seem cooler, I think. And B, it affects her algorithm. Have a clear plan in place to handle problems when they occur. So I got scammed. Um, I was buying dresses um, for uh, my daughter's senior recital was last week and we came up for that. And I bought a great dress on a site that I later found out was completely fake. It was advertised through Facebook. They had this amazing dress that I wanted to wear to my daughter's recital and it never showed up and it frauded my credit card. And I had a really honest, kind of honest conversation with my kids. Like I had paid like shipping upgrade fees to get it here quickly enough, done all these things. And all of a sudden I was out, you know, $195 plus I had to replace my, my, my um, debit card. I told my kids this story and what it, shows to them is that I've set the bar that I make mistakes too and allows them to come to me when their face got pictured on a kid in a Nazi uniform and sent to the head of the theater department. And listen to my mom, you know, count to 10 before you respond. Slow it down. I hope if folks have, I know there was one question in the Q&A, which I can pick up. What media does a news app fall under? So if it's a media that's coming from, you said you mentioned BBC or NPR or Fox News, or it's from a news site, that would fall under news in that slide that I showed. And if they're watching, now I'm not gonna be so good at, at naming the ones that are, are really just social media sites. If, it's, if they're getting news from Instagram um, or TikTok, that is a social media site. Kirsten, are there any other questions from folks? Not yet. That's all we've got so far. I have to say that I feel overwhelmed a lot by keeping up with my kids. And I guess probably my parents felt overwhelmed um, keeping up with me. Um, but diving in, and having the conversation before it's a crisis, before you know the doctored photo shows up, or um, I have a friend's son who was blackmailed um, about a, with a photo that wasn't real, it had been doctored. Um, really and truly making it a normal part of the conversation, turning it into a game, being honest about your own struggles. My three and a half hour day with playing privilege on my phone makes it okay for your kids to have those same conversations with you. I loved your idea, Kristen, of sending them things you want them to see more of. It seems so simple that I can't believe I never thought of it before you said it, but it's such an easy thing to do. <laughs> and, and you're right. You send one thing and that will really start changing the algorithm. It's not like you have to send five or six. No, you don't have right. to send a hundred of them. Right, right. And, and you really, like what you need to train your, yourself to do too is not to look at the car accident that comes through on your screen, right? Someone sends you something that's hateful and um, 
vilifying, I think as a human being, normally I would probably watch that two or three times. But all you're saying to this algorithm is, I love hateful and vilifying posts. Send me more of those. They watch how long you stay on the screen with anything. They watch what you forward. So by not forwarding it, by changing the way you respond, you're affecting the algorithm. It, and it really does help. I will say that, um, I don't know, maybe I'm getting sucked into the Harry Styles thing, but like I ended up listening to Harry Styles being interviewed by Howard Stern for an hour. The first half hour I was driving my kid to the, um, to the uh, to school. And so she and I were both listening and then I was driving home from school and I listened to the rest of it. And he had this great quote about believing in yourself that then I found on the Howard Stern's app and sent to her and said, hey, you didn't hear this part of the interview today, but listen to what Harry said. Um, and so if it's someone they respect, it's even better to get the words, not from you, but from the people who they're following and they're listening to and that they care about and respect. We all know that kids um, won't admit that they respect their parents' opinions, but they do. But the more you can show them that you're listening and you're um, interested in the things that they're interested in, then me having Charlotte's Instagram account on my phone is less about spying and more about having a conversation. Hey, Charlotte, I saw this really cool thing on your, on your Instagram feed. You know, how did you find that? I would love to be able to share that with um, other mom friends. We did have a question. Someone is asking, how can we use this information that you've been talking about to ease kids' anxiety about going to school? based on what's happened recently, which is a whole topic unto itself. I know. Um, but I think you might have some good suggestions. So um, I, 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 I don't know if recently is about the stuff that's happened um, in Trumbull recently, or if it's the stuff that's happened in the news um, recently. Um, but I think, my answer would respond to both. Um, the average person after the Twin Towers fell saw the image of those Twin Towers falling in the first two weeks about 200 times. Obviously, it only happened once. But what that does to your brain and that repeated um, trauma is puts you in a place where you can't escape it. So I would make the space to have the conversation about it first. And whether that's, you know, about what happened in Buffalo or in Texas or, you know, after a party um, here in Trumbull, make sure they've got a space to have that conversation and then have a conversation about, hey, where else are you hearing about this? What are people saying? Um, how does that make you feel? Without judgment, right? Hey, all the kids on Twitter are posting this stuff about X or about Y. Um, how does that make you feel? Do seeing, do seeing those posts make you feel better? Maybe, can, maybe we can limit, maybe you should, you know, just block that kid for a week if you know what he's gonna be sending out and make space for yourself to recover. And I think being really honest and saying, man, this is scary for me too. You know, uh, it is terrifying. And here are some of the ways I'm taking care of myself. You know, and then tell them whatever you're doing, you know what? I decided that I could not watch local news this week because I knew it was going to be on. And there was no new information coming out. I knew that it would not be healthy. So if not watching local news was what you we were going to do, maybe that's the best thing 
and and they may choose something different because maybe they would never watch the 530 news with you anyway. Um, but you know, figure out where and how you're taking care of yourself, share those ideas and make space for them to have the conversation and for them to then limit how much they have to see it and hear about it. If anyone has any other questions, please feel free to put them into the Q&A. You know, that made me think, Kristen, after um, Sandy Hook, I was a substitute teacher at the time and I had to go in um, right after it happened and I was in a fourth grade classroom. And as much as on my way there, I said, I'm not gonna talk about this all, you know, I'm not gonna say anything about it. Literally the minute the kids got there, they, they, that's all they wanted to talk about. Um, and, and so we sat down and what, the only thing I could think of to do was to talk to them about who the grownups were in their school that they trusted or they looked up to or they felt comfortable with. And we talked about um, how those grownups made them feel safe and how they felt safe in their classroom. And, and we talked about some of the ways that they had prepared for things like fire drills. And, and we talked about like, look how prepared you are. And this was before we did things like yep. lockdown drills, right? Um, but, um, and, and the kids started saying things like, oh yeah. And then, you know, Mr. So-and-so who was the gym teacher, like, yeah, if anything ever happened, you know, he would do this and he would do that. And, and the kids started feeling really like empowered, like, oh man, like the grownups in this school, they're not, they'd never let anything like that. It didn't matter if it was even true. Like they, they, they didn't then go into like, but it could, you know, it was just that feeling empowered of there's a lot of people here who care about us and who are going to keep us safe. And that kind of did it for like, they, they were ready then to go on with their day. Yeah. And, and it almost is akin to what you were saying about sharing positive stories or good things with your kids so that their algorithm changed. It was really just sharing stories about how safe everyone felt in the school all the time because there are a bunch of grownups that really cared about them that made them look at it differently. Um, so, you know, as, as the, the person who had asked that question and your answer brought me back to that time and made me think of that, um, just kind of changing it and making, turning it into a positive story almost as much as we possibly could. Well, before we end, um, I want to make sure no one has any more questions. Um, if you do have questions that maybe you just don't feel comfortable putting in the Q&A right now, you can certainly uh, email me. You have my email address in the um, registration email you receive, the reminder email you received, and I will make sure to get them to Kristen, and we can answer those questions for you personally. Happy to do that. Comfortable that way. Happy um, to do that. And I do want to remind everyone, if you want to rewatch this or share this or any of our previous or upcoming um, Let's Talk Mental Health Trumbull uh, sessions, they're always available um, on demand on TCTV and on the TPOD website, which is just tpodtpad.org. Um, so that those resources are always available to you. This one will be up um, probably in about a week or so.